welcome to today because today uh, we've got a show which is focused on pipeline mastery. And so the aim of a pipeline mastery is really help you guys be boringly brilliant. And so what do I mean by boringly brilliant? Well, the goal of being boringly brilliant is that you can just build the same month in, month out. And so in order to help us through this, I'm going to be syncing up a, a presentation uh, just to help us uh, run through some of the uh, some of the ideas that we're going to talk about today. Now, what I'd really like to, to feel is that as we go through today, we can uh, hopefully you can feel like you want to sort of just ask some questions and it may be we can get a, uh, a guest on the show as well. So uh, if you bear with me, bear with me a second. I'm just going to make sure, uh, just make sure we get things uh, all set up here, and uh, and and go from go from there. So uh, here we go. Right. Okay. So here we go. So what we're uh, what, what 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 we're aiming for here is that we don't really want to be a uh, a roller coaster recruiter. We don't want to be uh, really just billing the same billing sort of month in month out. Now we all like theme parks because. Uh, they're really exciting to be in, but what we don't want, uh, what we don't want when we're uh, when we're actually billing uh, day to day. Forgive me, I'm having a couple of uh, technical issues. Honey, so let's uh, let's just let's just let's just make it you, me, and the camera. Okay. So what we've got to what we've got to think about is why do recruiters get roller coaster uh, roller coaster billings? Well, the reason recruiters get roller coaster billings is that often uh, recruiters just love focusing on the, the job at hand, and the job at hand for many recruiters is really about you know what? Let me get some CVs over to those jobs. Let me get some CVs over to those jobs. And whilst on one hand that's really fulfilling because it it really enables us to feel like we're in the game. What it doesn't do is actually enable us to have a proper pipeline of opportunities because whilst we might have a great month this month, if we end up having a bad month next month, then really is it really worth all that? So uh, we're going to run through a few reasons and a few things that you're going to look at. Probably the first mistake that recruiters make when they when they think about how do I bill consistently is that recruiters worship the job order uh, and uh, recruiters worship the job order and what that means is that business development is only the thing that recruiters do when they don't have any jobs and what that means is that a lot of recruiters are just sitting there a job comes in and then they just sort of just worship that job for a week and they care for it and they ca caress it and they love it and what they're really wanting to do is just send CVs now, the challenge with that is, is the fact that when you worship the job order and really what you want to be doing is just sending CVs, it doesn't make it easy for you to keep objectivity. And what I mean by objectivity is that you spend too much time working jobs that you're not going to be paid for. So one of the things we're going to look at through this webinar is how do we not worship the job order as much? How do we get more on the go so we can actually get a return from, from the time that we invest? Uh, and the first sort of thing we're going to ask you to think about is how do you actually extend uh, your time horizon? And what I mean by time horizon is most recruiters are thinking about the next two, three, maybe even four weeks. What am I going to build? What am I going to build? But the reality is a large part of what you're doing today is going to indicate and dictate what your success is going to be in the next two, three, four months time. So let's think about a time horizon. So. Let's think about how it might work. So, for instance, it's November now, and my fees in November are probably going to be related to the interviews that I arrange in November. But actually, the interviews I get in November are probably the jobs that I picked up in October. And the jobs I pick up in October are probably the result of the leads that I generated in September. And they probably came from some of the business development activity that you did in July and August. So, if we flip that through to today, is the fact that the business development calls that you do today, the proactive relationship building that you do today, will probably be the jobs that you pick up in January, sorry, the leads you pick up in January, the jobs that you'll pick up in February, and the interviews and placements that you'll make in March. 
And so part of being consistent in your pipeline is no matter how busy you get with working jobs today, you start thinking about what am I doing today to make sure next month, the month after, and the month after that, I've got A grade vacancies to work. Remember, it's really easy to get vacancies to work, but great vacancies. And what I mean by great vacancies is where clients want to give you a high level of commitment and candidates are relatively easy to find, or at least you've got the time to find those candidates without six other agencies jumping on, the, uh, jumping on, the, on, on your back. And so we're gonna look at four areas that you can manage your pipeline on. The first thing we're gonna look at is how do you actually manage your placements? How you then will look at how do you prioritize the vacancies that you've got today? We'll then look at how you manage and organize leads, and then we'll look at networks at the end. And hopefully those of you that are watching, you may well ask some questions. I'll be keeping an eye uh, lower down the page here, and we'll see what we can, uh, we see, see what we can do. So the first place that we, we wanna go is we wanna be thinking about not about the business development work that we do, but when we think about our pipeline, you've got to be thinking about the most expensive mistakes that you can make. And so the most expensive mistakes you make are making sure the placements that you've made already stick. It never ceases to amaze me the number of recruiters that have candidates that are in their first two, three, four, five, six weeks, and they're not keeping in touch with those candidates to check they're doing okay. Now, I know inside your heart as a recruiter, you're like, oh, I know that commute was a bit far, or I know that boss was a bit, bit edgy. But if you're not proactively addressing those issues, the candidates that you've actually placed, you're going to get really expensive dropouts when maybe you've even been paid the, when you've been, even been paid the money, uh, but you may actually have to give it back. Another part of looking after your placements is what are your controls and processes to make sure from when a candidate offers the job, actually starts the job you know do you speak to them every week two weeks to check that those candidates are still up for the job what i'm seeing at the moment in the market is that some agencies when they hear a candidate's resign they go on a hot candidate board and those candidates are then getting calls from other agencies about other opportunities and so that means is that money that's maybe in the bank in your head is potentially being stolen from you from your competitors and so you've got to ask yourself, what are you doing through that notice period to make sure that that candidate stays bonded with that client uh, and make sure that the candidate is as excited about that opportunity three or four weeks after accepting the job as when they start. Now, in some markets like North America, you may only have a two week notice period. But in the UK, you average a four week notice period. In large parts of Europe, you're looking at maybe an eight or a 12 week notice period. And so what I'd ask you is that, could you really quickly turn to a list of candidates that you know are pending start? Because those are the individuals that you wanna be nurturing on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's why at Nurture It, we've got a special section that's dedicated towards organizing those placements to make sure you don't lose any of the money that you've got. So when we then think of the next aspect of our pipeline and we think, well, where else are the bits of our pipeline where we're gonna be becoming inefficient? And probably the biggest area of inefficiency when it comes to your pipeline is how you manage your jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, as I said at the start, some recruiters think their, their job is done. When I've got a vacancy to work, I care for it and I look after it and I caress it. And if you come off, I'm going to hit my target. But the reality is the best recruiters are super... Yeah, I've, I've just had a request to show you some pics. Uh, I'm sorry about that, Rob. I've, uh, uh, you're all going to wait for me while I fight for the tech? Okay, so bear with me a second. Right. So, uh, right, okay. Right, okay. So, share the screen. Right, okay. Here we are, okay, so we've done managing placements. So how can we actually pending starts? So the bit we're actually in, in now is about how do we actually prioritize the time that we've got? And the thing is with prioritizing your efforts is the fact that the best recruiters only spend time 
on things that are likely to turn into money. Now, that doesn't mean to say that loyal client that always gives you exclusivity calls you with a bit of a job that's left field, that, that purple squirrel. Of course, you'd give them some time. But how many times are you working jobs where it's multiple agency in a difficult location, the client's not getting back to you and it's awkward money? Now, I know many of you on the call may not do that, but a large section of the industry actually exists in a market whereby they are not getting paid for the time that they invest. I mean, in life, if someone said to you and you were maybe looking, if you were, if you were looking for a new friend, if someone said, well, I might be your friend, but you know what, I've got five or six other friends and I've, but I want you to go away, I want you to maybe do your hair, I want you to get a new outfit, and then I might consider being your friend. The likelihood is you wouldn't want to be friends with someone that made you do that. You'd want some sort of commitment in return. And the same goes with clients. Often we drop everything to go and do loads of work for clients without necessarily getting any commitment. And so one of the dialogues that you've got to have within your team is, well, how do we prioritize our effort based on the likelihood of us actually getting paid? And so the two drivers that I tend to look at when I'm making placements the first one is client commitment. And so what I mean by client commitment is, do they return your calls? Have you met them? Is the job exclusive? Equally important, how urgent is that client's need to recruit? A job where a client is looking for the perfect candidate that happens to come along is not a great job. It's not a job that you may not put some time into, but what you want is clients that want to make a decision in the next two or three weeks. You want clients where you've got workload that haven't been done. And so day to day, when you're prioritizing your effort, you need to be thinking like, how easy is this client making it for me to make some money? How likely is it that the effort they put in and I put in is going to result in a fee? The second area of prioritization is really thinking about candidate availability. And the higher the level of sourcing effort that you've got to put in, the lower the level of job that it is. And so if you find yourself where you've got low client commitment and high sourcing effort, well, that's a surefire way to set fire to your pipeline. What we want is opportunities where, you know what, it might be a bit of sourcing effort. It might take a bit of time to find a candidate that can do that job, but also at that location for that money, for that type of organization. But you've got to be thinking all the time, how much effort is it going to actually take for me to find these people? And so... What, what we've got to be thinking is our jobs, A jobs, B jobs, C jobs. You may do it differently in your organization, but what I would say is that you've got to be thinking about like A job gets 100% of my effort. I've got to put everything into it. A B job, you know, I'm going to put quite a lot of effort into it, but you know what, I'm going to hold back a bit. A C job is, well, maybe I'll do it after 5.30. I remember when I used to get a C job, my manager used to say, uh, you can work that C job after 5.30 because I'm not paying you nine to five to work a job that's not going to convert into money. And did I sometimes stay? Yep. Did I resent it? Probably. But now I look back and I know my manager is trying to make sure that I spent time on things that are going to relate to money. And if I don't have A grade jobs or B grade jobs, I've got to be thinking, where am I going to get A and B grade jobs from rather than nurture that job which is in an awkward location with an awkward client for a low fee so let's just uh move on and the benefits uh the benefits of this will mean that uh the benefits of this will mean that you get to start choosing the jobs that you work and when you can choose the jobs that you work it makes it much easier for you to feel like you're uh it makes it much easier to, to feel like you're in the uh you're you're in the mix and you're in the uh, in the power zone so where are we going to next? So once we've created a bit of capacity for business development is that now is the time to be really organized with how you manage your leads. And what I mean by that is that leads are the jobs of tomorrow. Now, there's different types of leads. You've got hot leads, which are people that are recruiting today. And every recruiter will be used to having to get a candidate, find someone that's recruiting, pick up the phone, call before eight call after six, you know, call someone upline, call someone downline, call another department in the business in order to get a referral. All those are great ways of chasing hot leads. But what you've got to ask yourself is the fact that do you organize your leads in a way that when you think about, I need a good vacancy, where am I actually going to be able to call? More often than not, I sit with recruiters and I go, 
tell me where your jobs are going to come from in the next 30 days. And they sort of go, well, not sure. And um, by sort of saying not sure, what, what, they're, what they're really doing is, uh, what they're really doing is sort of saying, well, I hope something's going to come in. The recruiters that have the most confidence in letting those C jobs go are the ones that know they've got lots of A and B jobs coming down the line. And so when you've organized your leads, not just the hot leads, but the warm leads. And warm leads are those companies where you think there's going to be something coming up in the next maybe 30 or 60 or 90 days, dependent upon the speed of your market. But say, for example, you've got a candidate that you're working with that's in a permanent job. Their current manager is a warm lead. Because if that's a candidate that's going to get placed, in all likelihood, there's going to be a vacancy where they're about to leave. What are you doing as part of your business development activity to make sure that when the candidates that you work with, or even those that you choose not to work with, when they leave, do their managers give you a call? And in all likelihood, they won't have heard of you. But what the best recruiters are able to do is use the information that they've got and use that to nurture additional relationships. Think about it in life. Day to day, all of you will be on LinkedIn. And when you go on to your LinkedIn, when you go onto a LinkedIn profile, it always says, these, can, these people who looked at this profile also looked at this. You've all been on Google, typed in a website, been to a website, and then had that website follow you around. The reason why LinkedIn, Facebook, Google are so good at what they do is they use their data exceptionally well. When they identify someone's got an interest or a, in a product or a service or something's happened in their profile, that could lead to them needing something else, they're really good at putting the right information in front of you. If you type in engagement into Google or in weddings in Google, you'll get followed by wedding adverts. Think about all the candidates that come into your business. Think about all the market information that comes into your business that you don't do anything with. And so a key part of your pipeline is to be really diligent in sourcing the names of people that could have a vacancy, not definitely, but could, and making sure you store those in a way. And you can see a screenshot here from Nurture It where we allow you to organize your hot leads, your warm leads, and your unqualified leads in a way that when you think, you know what, I've got half an hour to do business development, you can go to a list that not only will put you in the game, it will give you a chance of winning the game as well. So let's see what else we've, uh, we, we, we've, 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 got, in the, uh, we've got in here. So the question to you would be is that how do you organize your data? And the reason why organizing your data is so important is that from a performance management perspective, when you go to your manager, uh, I'm thinking, oh, I'm not going to bill much this month. They're going to be asking you, where are your jobs going to come from next month? And if you don't have an answer, uh, your managers can't help you. Your managers love to help you convert leads into opportunities. But if you don't have an organized list of leads, your manager can only talk to you about one thing. And that's probably how much have you been on the phone? It could be call numbers. It could be call time. But if you don't give your manager the raw material with which to help you with, they're going to hit you with that activity stick. And none of us like being hit with a core target hit stick. And the best way to deflect that stick is by going to your manager. Look, I've got these leads. I just don't know what to do. I've got this leads, I don't know what to do. And when you can do that, they're much more likely to go, oh, let me help you. You know, and they'll put the activity stick down and try and help you convert, convert that. And so what you wanna be doing is, is thinking about how can we actually nurture and convert uh, some of those leads uh, and get your manager to help you as well. Uh, if you're a new recruiter and you work in an office of other recruiters, Remember that there's loads of leads just in what your colleagues do every day, but decide not to follow up. And so if you see some of your colleagues working with candidates that they're not writing down the names of the companies where they work, don't be afraid to look up where that candidate works and start calling that client. Now, you wouldn't say that you know someone's looking, but it doesn't mean to say you can't call and be front of mind in what you're doing. The last area of your pipeline that you need to work with is you need to be thinking about what am I doing to nurture the networks that I've got? One of the failings of recruiters is that we've sort of fallen into the habit over the last 10 years of only really wanting to speak to people when we can make money from them. 
So we speak to a candidate when we've got a job, and then when they're not in running for that job, we discard them. We speak to a client when they've got a job, and when they don't have that job, we sort of discard them until they've got that next job. And so what I was taught, and what I know works from the hundreds of top fillers that I work with, is that the best recruiters don't want to speak to people just when they can make money from them. They have networks of individuals that they keep in touch with on an ongoing basis. So when those individuals either are looking for a job or have a vacancy, the first person they think of is that recruiter. Think about TV advertising. Well, how often do I watch a McDonald's advert and go, oh my goodness, I, I, must, go, I must go to McDonald's. Or uh, I see a pizza advert and go, that's it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have pizza. But what they're doing in marketing speak is trying to embed front of mind awareness. If I said, let's get takeouts pizza, what name would come front of mind? For me, it's about Domino's. Uh, but if I said, we wanna go for an Italian, where would you go? So when we're nurturing uh, our networks, what we wanna be doing is, is keeping in touch with people. Now, animals asked a great question. Do people really wanna hear from recruiters when they don't need them? Well, they may not wanna know about jobs. So from a candidate's perspective, will they still be interested in careers in their industry? Will they still be interested in industry news? From a line manager perspective, uh, we're not just CV machines. If all we are is CV machines, then, I mean, Google can do that, right? They can give you CVs. But if you're a recruiter that exists in a niche or a tight geographical market, uh, or you're a consultative recruiter in your approach, can you let clients know about why people are leaving assignments at the moment? Can you educate them of uh, the type of uh things that are going on in the industry and so a call might go like you just might ring a candidate for instance uh and you and you might sort of ring up and you just go hey bob how you doing i know uh last time we spoke you said that your ideal job uh would be working for oracle down the road there and i just wanted to let you know uh that we haven't had anything for oracle yet but i wanted to let you know i hadn't forgotten about you i know i promised to be your eyes and ears in the marketplace uh, so how are things going at the moment where you are? Now, again, what you're trying to do is just sort of say to them, look, I haven't forgotten about you. And remember, phone isn't the only way. You can do that on email. You can just say, I saw this thought of you. You know, a lot of times you'll see adverts for other companies that you're not going to have access to. So you can take that job and flip it onto Bob and say, hey, I saw this. It's sort of similar to what you said you were looking for. And, and just like you have to nurture client relationships, that's what you have to do when you nurture passive relationships. When you're working with a client, uh, you might, and, you, and they don't have a vacancy, you might give them a call. And let's say, for example, we want to find out how that project they're working on at the moment is going. And we might want to take a candidate to market. And that means we take a profile of candidate. Now, the mistake that we often make is that we call with that profile of candidate and say, do you want to hire? Do you want to hire? Do you want to hire? Where the reality is, is that we just want to let them know that if they have a problem, we can help. It's a bit like you walk up to them and go, you've got a watch. And if that watch breaks, I have watches. But I hope your watch doesn't break. You know, and that's what we're looking to do when we keep in touch. But you can advise clients on the market, salary benchmarking. I used to do a lot of calls to clients about this time, actually, when I knew they had December year end because they're all doing budgeting. And I used to ring my clients and go, hey, how are you doing? Uh, I know you're going through your budgeting process right now. And when you do your payroll budget, uh, feel free to give me a shout and I can benchmark some of the skill sets you've got in your team against salaries of what people are being paid today. Now, did everyone call me? No. Did many people talk to me about that? Well, no. But the point was, is I was creative in thinking up a reason for calling that demonstrated to that client that I knew them, I knew where their business was at, and I was trying to help them irrespective of whether they could pay me money today. The challenge is, is we only want to speak to people when we have got money to be made. You know, and what we've got to do is be really creative in how we get in front of clients just to sort of say, hi, it's me. So, so that's from a, from, a, from, a, from a network perspective, you're going to have three networks. You're going to have your client network of people that have given you business. You're going to have your future client network, which is the people you want to give business. And then you're going to have your candidate network. And within that, you'll have your active candidates and you'll have your passive candidates. The art of being a good marketing centric recruiter is not about calling them and selling to them. It's about contacting them and just sort of saying, hi, 
if you need me, I'm here. The last thing I'll think about is that when you work your pipeline on a day to day basis, do you have visibility? One of the challenges when we look at our pipeline is often we think we're really busy. We think we've got a lot on the go, but actually when we draw it out, when we look at the value of what we've got at each stage of the process, we actually don't really have very much. And so what you need to do, whether it be with Excel or through your CRM or maybe even nurture it, is to think about how can I visualize my pipeline in a way that reminds me that I don't have enough on the go. Uh, so, so that's, that's sort of the last thing that you want to look at. And the great thing is, is when you can visualize that pipeline, what you're then able to do is be able to start to plan, where should I focus my time? And so in this instance here, you can see this individual has got relatively little at first and second interview, but it's got a good pipeline of jobs. And what that would then mean is that they can spend a bit more time on those jobs because they know they've got more jobs coming in the future. So Animals just asked me uh, another question, and I'm conscious of time for everybody. Uh, so Animal says, so can you just send them links to articles that they, that they never read just so they see that you exist? And I'd say yes. You know, and, I, and the reason I'd say yes is that what you want to be doing is you wouldn't just fire them a link and leave it at that. But what you would do is you would sort of send them a link and say, I saw this because I thought it was relevant to this. And as long as the value of that email is in what you write to connect, that article with what you know about that client. So it could be is that, like, I know you're going through budget process at the moment and I found this salary guide and I thought you might find it interesting. Or I saw this article about your competitor and I thought you might find it interesting. You know, what we're trying to do is just say, we're here. You'd be amazed at the number of times where people just go, thanks for that, or not relevant, but I appreciate you thinking of me. Why do we like Christmas cards? Why do we like birthday cards? Because we like being thought of. Uh, and that's what we've got to try and do is just say to people, I'm thinking of you and I want to add value to our relationship. So when you do have a need, you'll, you'll think of me too. And it's the reason it doesn't necessarily fit with natural recruiters is it's very marketing centric approach to business development. Recruiters typically take a very short term view, which is, can I smash down the door? Can I force someone in? Can I take the fee and leave? Well, what we've got to be thinking is we've got to make clients want to work with us. And by making them want to work with us, we've got to show that we care about them, even when they don't have checks to pay. Now, as a caveat to that, will there be still people that don't want to respond? Of course. This isn't a silver bullet, but it's just about incrementally increasing your front of mind awareness. So we're at the end of the uh, we're at the end of the webinar. Let's close this off a minute. I really apologize for some of the uh, technical delays and technical problems. But hopefully this has given you some of the things that you need to think about when you look at your pipeline. So in summary, how do you look after your existing placements? Do you have a list of people that are pending start that you can look at every day to check you are managing the risks that are still in existence that you need to mitigate to make sure that person starts? When it comes to vacancies, do you have visibility of your pipeline? And are you prioritizing the effort that you put into those vacancies in your pipeline to make sure that you spend the most times on the ones that you're most likely to get paid? It's OK to tell a client you're not going to work the job. It's OK to work a job, but not work it particularly hard. But what is not OK is to take a bad job where you've got low client commitment and high sourcing effort and waste your precious life not getting paid. And whilst, when you go back from your pipeline, you need leads. I don't care whether you use a spreadsheet. Uh, you don't, don't, sorry, I've just asked this last question. I don't care if you're using a spreadsheet. I don't care if you're using paper. I don't care if you're using your CRM. I don't care if you're using Nurture It. You know, what you need to know is have a big list of people that you know are recruiting in your market today and those that you think are going to be recruiting in the future. The more awareness you have of where your market is, the more confident you'll be in approaching business development and the more confident you'll be in letting vacancies go. And the last step of your pipeline is to start thinking of the lists of candidates that you've got, the clients that you want to do business with and the clients that you do business with as individuals that you need to nurture. And nurturing is about maintaining front of mind awareness. I don't encourage everyone to look, type in uh, Google zero moment of truth. And there's some really good articles in there around 
how people make buying decisions. And what I mean by that is that nowadays when we want to buy something, by the time we, we go to the shop or we pick up the phone, we've almost decided what we're going to buy. It's all about front of mind awareness. So when we want to buy something, we tap it into a computer. We might ask friends and, and family. What you've got to do is nurture your networks. So in the moment of need, they think of you at that zero moment of truth. So that's it for today. I really appreciate you logging in. Uh, we're back in a couple of weeks with a guest. And uh, if anyone's interested, feel free to email me and I'll send you a handout that covers some of this stuff. And lastly, but not least, is the Nurture It, uh, the business I've founded to help recruiters manage their pipeline is free for individual recruiters. And so I'd encourage you to go in and have a look. And a lot of what we've spoken about here is built into that system. And it's free for individual recruiters because I really, really, really care about you getting paid for the most amount of time and effort that you put in. So feel free to check that out. Feel free to subscribe if you like this and you want to see more. So thank you very much. See you soon. Goodbye.